예, 시작하도록 하겠습니다. 오케이, 어, 오케이, 어, let us get start. 아, uh, because it's time. 아, uh, good morning and uh, good evening uh, for those of you from log login from United States. Uh, I'm Sanyan Lee, uh, Senior Research Fellow at the Sejong Institute. Well, uh, before we start, uh, let me give you a brief introduction about uh, this webinar. Uh, this uh, webinar uh, is part of the Seoul Washington Forum program uh, funded by a Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Korea. And uh, as you see, uh, this event is open to public. So uh, simultaneous translation is provided. Uh, please check uh, your uh, uh, web browser uh, to, uh, to check the uh, translation box. Well, uh, during the uh, webinar, if you have any question or comments, uh, please use the chat box and Q&A box to uh, uh, upload your uh, question and comments. And uh, uh, this year, uh, Sejong is planning to host the six or seven uh, webinar of this kind. So uh, please uh, keep tuned uh, uh, for us. So before, uh, uh, without uh, further ado, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Hak Sung Pak, uh, president of the Sejong Institute for uh, welcoming remarks. Dr. Pak. My uh, warmest uh, greetings to, to you all and welcome to this webinar on the Biden administration's North Korea policy and its implications uh, for the uh, ROK US Alliance, US ROK Alliance, what's new and what's challenging. Today's event is co hosted by uh, USIP and the Sejong Institute. And thank you, Ambassador Joe, and thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Joe Yoon, and thank you, Frank. And uh, also, as uh, Sangyan uh, uh, men mentioned already, but uh, my uh, thanks to thanks also goes to Foreign Ministry for sponsoring. Uh, this very important seminar. Thank you. I will, I will uh, say hello to uh, all the participants later uh, you know, during the uh, you know, presentation session. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Peck. Uh... Now, uh, I would like to invite uh, two uh, distinguished panelists for introductory remarks. Uh, Dr. Jung In Moon, uh, Chairman of the Sejong Foundation and Vice Chair of the APLN. Asia Pacific Leadership Network for uh, Nuclear Disarmament, Nuclear Non Proliferation and Disarmament, and Ambassador Joseph Yoon, who is a senior advisor to the Asia Center, USIP, and former uh, ambassador to Malaysia. Uh, uh, Dr. Chong In Moon, please. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> and I'd also thank you, you know, uh, Ambassador Yoon and, uh, you know, Frank Am, um, you know, for co organizing this event. Uh, and I think I believe that the Sangyan and the Frank will be organizing another, uh, you know, the event regarding peace game on the Korean Peninsula, uh, sooner or later. And therefore, I'm very glad that the USIP and the Sejong Institute are cooperating each other so closely. And yet, you know, I'm supposed to give a talk on, you know, this, you know, the summit and implications for the ROK US alliance and the uh, uh, U.S. policy on North Korea, you know, but uh, as you all, all you can see that uh, President Moon Jae-in was very, very satisfied uh, at the result of the summit. And uh, you know, even though there is just some mixed assessment in South Korea, but the, generally speaking, the Korean public is in great support of the summit. And particularly, you know, President Biden's in the way of handling, you know, President Moon Jae-in. And we realized that uh, President Biden is very different from President Trump. He really cares about alliance. We did not see any transactional aspect of alliance management. He treated you know, President Moon with sincerity <clears throat> and warms, and therefore President Moon was very happy. Particularly, you know, our government really focused on the you know, Biden's policy in North Korea, but uh, to my understanding that the Biden administration accommodated most of you know, uh, Moon Jae-in government's you know, the wish list, you know. For example, you know, the Biden administration, you know, Biden administration accommodated all this, you know, the, the honoring of the Panmunjom and Singapore declaration. And also, uh, you know, we didn't expect that the Biden administration would appoint, you know, 
uh, special representative to North Korea because the State Department has been sending signals that uh, the Biden administration would appoint, you know, human rights ambassador, not the, in a special representative, but there was a reversal. And uh, at, at the press conference, uh, President Biden abruptly, you know, appointed the Sung Kim as a special representative. That was a very, very, you know, increasing sign. And also, you know, and there was a concern that the, you know, the, the U.S. would uh, make a calling out of no screen human rights. Yes, it did. But there was a nice balance between the human right and the, uh, you know, humanitarian assistance to North Korea. Therefore, you know, both the U.S. and South Korea saved face in a sense. You know, but, you know, and also uh, most importantly, uh, you know, there was a kind of uh, President Biden's you know, endorsement of South Korean dialogue and engagement and cooperation with North Korea. And uh, that was a very encouraging sign. And therefore, given all this, you know, the Biden administration's, you know, the policy in North Korea, which was much more, uh, advanced than the, the Saki's brief introduction of policy review on April 30s. And therefore, it was very encouraging news to South Korea. And therefore, I would say that, you know, that will really strengthen the alliance with, you know, alliance between South Korea and the United States. Therefore, you know, it really, it, it uh, I was, you know, shocked at the breadth, breadth of the, you know, joint in a statement, you know, how many pages? And you know, I recall that uh, the Gyeongju summit in, in October 2005 between President Nong Hyun and George W. Bush was very, very lengthy, but it's about mostly on the Korean Peninsula issue and North Korean issue. Uh, but uh, this time, you know, it covers everything in the it's a peninsula issue and the regional issue and global issue. And it's also covering from the everything from the uh, North Korea Alliance, science and technology, you know, atomic energy cooperation and space cooperation, you know, you name it, and the pandemic vaccine cooperation. Therefore, it's a kind, kind of omnibus of allocated US bilateral relations. There was a very encouraging and also they assured in a combined in a defense of you know the Korean at the South Korea they there was a reassurance of extended in a deterrence and you know and also most importantly you know the you know there was a, the missile you know guideline was lifted and now we are free to develop you know our you know uh, you know missiles and plus, that really opened our getaway to the space development. You know, I don't know. You know, the Korean scientist uh, in the area of space has been complaining that, that they couldn't develop the whole this in you know, the launching technology, boosting technology because of missile guideline. Now it's their turn to prove that uh, we can do something on space use. You know, and also we have agreed to join the. Artemis in a program so that we can be part of, you know, all this U.S. Uh, initiated so-called space program, the sending, you know, uh, you know the man to the you know, moon and, uh, you know, uh, the, the, and the space, you know, there was you know, other good issues. Therefore, overall, I would say that the, 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 the statement of the alliance between Seoul and Washington was very, very encouraging. There was a very a clear reconfirmation of the alliance, and all those guys who argued that there has been rupture in the Arrokeus alliance uh, turned out to be wrong. You know, there is a you know, clear reassurance of you know, ongoing you know, alliance between the two countries. But I see, you know, three major you know problems. You know, as you all know, that the devils are in detail. You know. Therefore, you, know, you can come up with a really, really wonderful parade of a mutual commitment uh, of the alliance. And but uh, in uh, in the process of implementing them, we could see a lot of you know challenges. So first is you know, as all you know that uh, we'll be having our U.S. joint uh, military exercise in August. Ulti freedom guidance. You know, if that happens, then. You know, there could be another, you know, 
crisis, whatever, or the you know, downside of the overall relations. I personally believe that the North Korea will respond to American call this time. Uh, I may be wrong, but I'm very positive, okay? Uh, and Mr. Yoon is, was, was even telling that the North Korea may not show up, but uh, my personal hunch, you know, I have been dealing with North Koreans almost you know, more than 30 years, and uh, it's very likely that the North Korea will come, uh, if not to the United States directly, maybe it will come to South Korea, okay? And I'm hoping that North Korea uh, you know, reactivate the you know, hotlines between the North and South Korea, because they will be really anxious to hear on the, what went on. <laughs> in particularly, in a joint statement does not indicate any specifics or details of what the US can offer to North Korea. Therefore, North Koreans will be very much interested in knowing about it. And I'm hoping that they will come back. But, but you know, but in, in, the, in the time of two months time period, you know, that there will be in a planned joint exercise. And, and if that being the case, uh, you know, things can fall apart <laughs> again. Therefore, first, you know, litmus test is, you know, whether North Korea will come out or not, and when whether we can, you know, Seoul and Washington can uh, conduct the joint military exercise or not will be the first test. And second is that if North Korea comes forward, okay, despite their, you know, very un, uh, uncomfortable behavior to our, to us, you know, and uh, the, the demolition uh, you know, of the joint you know, liaison office in Kaesong and et cetera. But if they comes out, then maybe, you know, the Moon Jae-in government may want to try something with North Korea. Because as I pointed out, the joint statement assured that uh, uh, the US will support the inter-Korean dialogue, engagement, and cooperation. Okay. And then Moon Jae-in government may come up with an actual you know, cooperative project with North Korea. Okay. I don't know whether U.S. and South Korea will uh, resume, you know, uh, in a joint group or not. Okay, uh, so-called joint working group or not. Okay, and but uh, that being the case, whether U.S. will be tolerant of South Korea in a venture toward North Korea. Okay, because you know Moon Jae-in has less than one year, you know, uh, time period. You know. The, his term will be over May next year, and then president's election campaign will start sometime from late September or October. Okay, and then President Moon will be losing momentum for inter-Korean cooperation. Therefore, he might want to hasten some, you know, a project with North Korea. Okay, therefore, you know, that will be the, you know, says second test, you know. And third one is, you know, what the U.S., you know. U.S. didn't come up with any kinds of you know, concrete ideas on how to engage with North Korea other than, okay, here's my telephone number, you know, you can call me and we can talk, okay? At the working level, Sun Kim, and also I missed it just the, the, another important point is the appointment of Sun Kim, you know? And you no, know, but they didn't give out, you know, what are the so-called special measures for the, or initial, you know, measures to reactivate in you know, the US DPRK dialogue or not. Okay. And maybe, you know, we, you know, we can talk about the vaccine cooperation because North Koreans love in you know, a Pfizer and Moderna, you know, not A Z, therefore Americans have Pfizer and Moderna. Okay, maybe US can send that kind of gesture or humanitarian assistance, okay, on that one, or you know, zero carbon, you know. Uh, relate proposal could be another one, okay? The, that would be the kind of, you know, uh, interesting thing. Therefore, you know, what would be the the follow-up American signal to Pyongyang? Of course, Pyongyang should send the signal too, okay? And uh, therefore, in general, you know, I would say, that, uh, you know, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, to conclude, I would say that the summit was extremely successful. Summit really, rekindle the waning uh, you know, the dialogue with North Korea, 
and was it has brought about positive results on our KBS alliance. It is good, good studying, but there is a one dilemma of a political cycle, or dilemma of a mismatch of a political cycle. The Moon Jae-in government is getting out of in, within a year, and the Biden administration is a new start. Okay, therefore there is a very uneasy mismatch between the two, you know. But within this remaining, you know, in the 11 months time period, uh, you know, to what extent uh, two leaders can come up with, uh, you know, a major breakthrough to the Korean stalemate, you know, that will be a major challenge, but still, you know, better than nothing. And I hope the two leaders can come up, can work out something concrete to make a peace, stability, and denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for a very broad overview. Um, now I would like to invite uh, Ambassador Yoon uh, for uh, introductory remarks, uh, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Moon. From your backdrop, I can see why you write a lot. You have so many books there, so many papers, you know, and I spend all, all my time reading your stuff. You know? <laughs> Uh, I very much agree with Dr. Mo, uh, uh, Professor Moon. It was a very successful visit. And it reminded me, I mean, we've had, I've seen many summits and this was one of much better ones. I've seen some very bad ones too, you know? And this one reminded me of the summit between Bill Clinton and, and, and DJ, uh, President Kim. And I was thinking, you know, what, what is different this time? And I think there's something to be said about, you know, there is a center left government in South Korea. And now we have in US also a center left mm -hmm. government. Really the last assign, uh, alignment of two uh, center left government was, I would say probably Bill Clinton and, uh, and, and, and President Kim Dae-jung. Uh, and and, and, and I, I, I really never got nervous during the joint, uh, joint, in, uh, joint press conference. And I used to get quite nervous when uh, Trump was there because I didn't know what he might say, for example. Uh, and I, you know, the body language and everything, it seemed the two, two leaders shared something. You know, for example, when the... Uh, when, 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 a, when, a, when a reporter asked about, uh, about Taiwan, whether there was pressure coming from Taiwan, uh, you know, and, and, and of course there was pressure on Taiwan. Uh, President Moon kind of smiled and looked at uh, uh, President Biden and said, no, 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 there was not much pressure. Uh, and I thought uh, that kind of showed the, that they were beginning to understand and I think in Korean, you would say, you know, I think they were having, <laughs> having, having that kind of connection. So our, our, our main issue is, of course, about North Korea. And, uh, and I'm glad to be doing introductory remarks because, because I can ask questions because I really don't have many answers, you know. And I think President, uh, sorry, uh, Professor Moon is right. There were many things South Koreans took with them to which U.S. agreed. Uh, you know, starting from uh, from the Panmunjom Declaration to joint Singapore Joint Agreement, and then also the mention in the same sentence of denuclearization and permanent peace, uh, and then also obviously big endorsement from Biden. On, uh, on inter-Korean uh, dialogue and cooperation. So the whole thing, the Biden administration, the whole policy review concluded, and they are now calling it calibrated and practical approach. Uh, that's the approach to North Korea. And I'm not quite sure what that means. Is it the same thing as step-by-step -step approach? Is it same thing as a phased uh, phased approach or, or can we even go a step further and say it's taking elements of arms control approach 
Uh, I mean, I would say really, you know, that isn't, if that's the approach, we've had six party talks, of course, that was a phased approach and in, and, and, and in, in, in a lot of sense, agreed framework was also a fa phased approach. And even the leap day deal was, you know, was the beginning of a phased approach. So what is new about it, you know? And, and that's certainly the question I would pose to our panelists. Uh, a second point is that, of course, the uh, US side, you know, pretty much accepted things like Singapore uh, Joint Statement and Panmunjom Declarations. But at the same time, they made a point of, you know, stating human rights improvement is very important and full implementation of UN Security Council resolution and also the importance of US, South Korea, Japan, trilateral cooperation in dealing with North Korea issues. So there was a lot of negotiations, each side putting forward their language and, and a compromise between that language. So my fundamental question uh, to our panelists would be, yes, it looks like very nice summit. It looks like each other accepted some of the deeply held concerns on North Korea policy. Does it though represent a convergence of views a uh, narrowing of the gap. So in other words, have, have fundamental positions changed? And certainly, you know, on, on, on US side, we have some of our best experts on North Korea issues. Bob Einhorn is, you know, he's been, he's the name, name number one in uh, arms control and non-proliferation. Sumi Terry was with uh, CIA and NSC. Uh, really dealing with nuts and bolts of North Korea issues. And my colleague at USIP, Frank, dealt with the nexus of, you know, uh, of, of things like uh, nu uh, nuclear weapons and their effect on, on, on US ROK alliance. Just before we turn to them, uh, Professor Moon mentioned, of course, getting rid of limits on the missile guidelines. To me, that was a complete surprise. I did not expect it. And I guess that would mean that uh, South Korea can, can make any missiles and the only limit is probably consistent with the uh, multilateral obligations, MTCR obligation. I mean, this raises for me a question. So South Korea has missile sovereignty. Does this mean, you know, the next step is South Korea might get civilian nuclear sovereignty, which is the right to enrichment and reprocessing capabilities? I wonder, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and, and we certainly have experts here to discuss these issues. So I'm very much looking forward to our session. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Well, thank you, uh, Ambassador Yun. Um, well, I appreciate the two gentlemen uh, for giving us enough thought to start with. So uh, let's get in a panel uh, presentation and discussion. This session will be moderated by Dr. Peck. Uh, Dr. Peck, back to you. Uh, please unmute. Uh, thank you, Sang Yun. Uh, so we are already behind time schedule. So let me uh, uh, just begin by uh, introducing uh, very prominent uh, six uh, presenters for today. Uh, let me uh, introduce the American side first, Bob Einhorn, uh, Senior Fellow, Arms Control Initiative and Center for Security and Intelligence, Brookings Institution. Uh, Thank you, Bob, for joining us today. And uh, Sumi Terry, Senior Fellow, Korea Chair CSIS. Uh, thank you, Sumi, for, for your participation. 
and uh, Frank um, Senior Expert in North Korea, USIP. Thank you for our coordinate co-organizer of this uh, this webinar. Uh, we have Kim Gi Jung uh, on the Korean side, uh, Director of Institute for uh, National Security Strategy, and uh, Jeon Bong Gun, Professor, uh, Korea National uh, Diplomatic Academy, and uh, and and Sang Hyun, Lee Sang Hyun, uh, the Sejong Institute. Uh, you know, uh, this uh, the Korea U.S. summit uh, covered not only North Korea issue, not only uh, you know Korea U.S. alliance issue, but also covered the other issues, including uh, uh, climate, global health, global health and the emerging new technologies. But uh, you know, our focus for today is for you know, North Korea policy. Uh, so uh, we thought of uh, three key questions uh, in advance for presentation and discussion. Uh, they, uh, they are uh, the assessment of Biden administration's completed North Korea review, policy review, and second, uh, you know, North Korea policy you know, agreed on at, at, uh, at the summit a few days ago, and also future prospects for North Korea policy. Uh, let me uh, begin with the, the first key question. The Biden administration announced that it has completed a uh, review of its policy toward North Korea. What are the main characteristics and the components of the new North Korea policy? And how new is it compared to previous administration North Korea policy? Why don't I ask uh, Ki Jung and Bob to uh, focus on this first question, even though uh, you are free to uh, make comments and raise questions and other, uh, you know, other questions as well. Uh, and uh, Ki Jung, first, please. Oh, let me let me, you. let me let me warn you. Let me warn you. Oh, Ki Jung, please. Let me warn you. I'm sorry, you know, to use the the uh, the the word "warn" because we have very limited time. So five minutes, very strict. Five, five, five minutes. minutes. Five, five minutes. minutes. Okay. 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 I'll, I'll do it. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best. My best. Uh, thank you for, for uh, the invitation, invitation to the Washington, Washington Forum. Forum. And, uh, and, uh, I like, I like to say, to say hello, hello to, to Smitty, Mr. Uh, Einhorn, Ambassador Yoon, and Frank. Hi, how are you, Frank? Uh, <laughs> I'm very glad that the Dodgers have, uh, you know, good scores, good, you know, performance these days. Uh, <clears throat> I I retired uh, Yonsei, Yonsei University last year, and and uh, I was appointed as, uh, even though Dr. Beg. Uh, you know, introduce me as a director, but he, it doesn't matter. But uh, in English, I'm I'm called as president here, uh, president at INSS. <laughs> well, um, I uh, you know, well, good summary of, uh, of uh, you know uh, the Professor Moon and uh, Joe about the you know recent summit meeting of uh, between the Moon and Biden. In a word, uh, I think that the uh, U.S. ROK alliance is, seems to be entering into a new chapter of, uh, you know, the true alliance. Uh, so many people in South Korea expecting uh, a lot in future. Uh, good things would happen. I was asked to speak of um, uh, Biden's new Korea policy, new uh, North Korea policy. Um, let me say in this way, um, in Washington, uh, maybe we, uh, we assume that uh, there are, or there have been three different types of uh, ideas how to deal with North Korea in terms of a categorization of North Korea policy. Uh, one is a tip for tad or even you know strategic patience when the you know Obama administration has applied before, and uh, the second group is uh, you know disarmament policy, disarmament approach, 
The third one is a coercive measures or you know, hawkish approach to the, uh, North Korea. I think, I think that uh, Biden's new, Korea, uh, new North Korea policy is seems to be located in between among the three. It is a you know, well-coordinated, well-balanced you know, approach among, even among the three uh, you know, uh, approaches. So in South Korea, we view in this way, uh, some some keywords appeared in uh, you know policy outlines, and his statement as well as his uh, speech. That uh, one is a practical you know practical approach. It means that it is uh, maybe they are you know Biden's uh, you know Biden administration is searching for a workable. It's very practical. You know they are searching for a, uh, workable solutions, and also. The you know practical means that uh, uh, in terms of a method, in terms of channels to you know deal with North Korea, I think they are willing to combine the, the so-called bottom-up approach and the top-down approach in practical ways. You know the second one is a collaborated approach. I think that is um, in Korean uh, it is uh, translated in uh, something. Johan, it is in detail, but in it also, I understand it is it has it has the meaning of that uh, you know detail and faced uh, and detailed detailed implementation uh, of new North Korea policy, but in the, it also it has the meaning of the adjustable and the flexible approach to North Korea. Diplomatic solution would be very much important. They are. They, you know, they seems to prefer to, you know, diplomatic or, you know, the negotiation or even, you know, communication would be much more important than the, you know, course of measures only. Complete denuclearization, the term complete, complete means that it is overall and, you know, com the, the word complete means it is a comprehensive, you know, the word. So the, com uh, not CVID or, you know, an FFVD, this would complete denuclearization is uh, uh, it is a good result, and uh, you know by which we can we can we will be able to avoid some kind of unnecessary misunderstanding and uh, speculation around you know surrounding the, the term, and uh, <clears throat> so overall overall evaluation about Biden's new North Korea policy in general. You know, this is a view from South Korea. I think this is a uh, good sign of hope uh, to South Koreans that uh, you know the uh, during the last four years under the uh, President Moon Jae-in, uh, the year of 2017 it was a full of a crisis. 2018 it was a hope. 2019, we were waiting and waited. So we call it this is year of patience. And uh, 2020, we tried to uh, search for a new breakthrough because it was a stalemate between North Korea and Washington's, you know, negotiation. But in uh, 2021, now we will be, you know, we we are uh, able to find a you know new solution. We call it reactivation of the hope reactivation of the momentum of 2018. So with a new North Korea policy from the Biden administration and the successful uh, you know, result of the recent uh, summit meeting between the Moon and Biden, so many South Korean people now uh, is ready to hope, you know, ready to have a hope for a reactivation of the hope or, or even you know the work of a solution of the 2018 the most importantly that the Biden administration agreed you know to recognize the importance of a Singapore you know joint uh, uh, the, the joint statement uh, and also it uh, you know Biden's new Korea policy seems to uh, reflect that uh, South Korea as allies, South Korea's uh, ideas and you know opinions in uh, you know with regard to how to deal with North Korea uh, for the future. Um, 
for South Korea, it is uh, now we have to think again uh, how to uh, perform the South Korea as uh, you know driver's role on the Korean Peninsula. So uh, one more thing uh, to mention: uh, Sung Kim as a special representative, you know, special envoy to North Korean affairs. I think there was much. It is very much important in terms of timing. You know, we've been we've been thinking that how to deal with the uh, you know Biden administration to of uh, you know the North Korea. You know, who's going to appoint it first? Uh, North Korea special envoy to you know special envoy to North Korea or human rights envoy to North Korea. So Sun Kim appointment you know, in advance to uh, human rights, I think that was a good sign to North Korea, you know, the, because, you know, it is, it is interpreted in this way. If the, you know, Biden administration appointed as a human rights is at first, human rights issues <clears throat> will be located on the, you know, outset or entrance of the, you know, communication. And uh, that would be a very much difficult way to uh, solve the problem or solve the, you know, the communication with North Korea. I'll stop my presentation here. It is, uh, I, I think it is five minutes. Uh, it was more than five minutes though, but uh, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Bob, please. Uh, Hak Soon, thank, thank you very much. I'll try to answer your question. Uh, and read the, uh, the tea leaves um, about what the principal elements are of the Biden administration's approach to North Korea. In its public rollout uh, of the North Korea policy review, uh, the administration has often said more about what the policy is not than what the policy is. So it's not a grand bargain. It's not strategic patience. Uh, it will not follow the mistakes of its predecessors. So we know what it's, it's not. In describing what it is, the administration has often used reassuring generalities, such as the words practical, calibrated, measures. Uh, these are, these are you know, they're unassailable formulations. Who would, who would attack those formulations? But they don't reveal very much uh, about the administration's actual positions, but I don't fault them for that. Uh, mm -hmm. They need time to consult with their allies in particular. They want to preserve negotiating flexibility, uh, and they believe negotiations are often carried out best uh, in private and not in the public eye. Uh, based on what they've said publicly and interpreting uh, what they've said based on uh, my familiarity with some of the individuals involved, uh, I'd, make, I'd make the following points uh, about the administration's approach. Uh, its declared goal is complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, but it has no expectation that that goal can be achieved in the foreseeable future. It will actively engage in diplomacy, but believes diplomacy must be supported by strong economic pressure powerful deterrence and alliance solidarity. Uh, it will not seek an elaborate long-term roadmap of sequence steps leading all the way to complete denuclearization. I think it's written off this kind of long-term uh, roadmap. Um, it will instead pursue a variety of near-term measures to address particular nuclear and missile threats to the United States and US allies. It will remain flexible and not get locked into a particular negotiating construct or set of proposals. It will develop an extensive menu of measures designed to limit the North Korean threat. And as uh, it gains a clear understanding through engagement of what the North Koreans will accept and what they will seek in return, it will then be in a better position to decide which measures to prioritize and what price they should pay for those prioritized measures. The benefits it will provide uh, to North Korea will be commensurate 
with the limits the North limits the North Koreans are prepared to accept modest compensation for modest constraints, readily reversible benefits for readily reversible constraints, no unilateral gestures in the hope of bringing the North Koreans to the negotiating table. The administration will consult closely with allies, especially the ROK, to achieve a common approach to North Korea. It also recognizes the critical role that China can play and will make every effort to gain Be Beijing's support for its approach to the negotiations. Uh, it supports advances in North Korean, I'm sorry, it supports advances in inter-Korean relations but believes the pace of North-South progress should continue to be related to progress on the nuclear issue. And I can go into uh, uh, more detail on why I think that remains uh, to be the case. Uh, it believes diplomacy is often best carried out in private and will continue to be reluctant to share details of its approach uh, in public. I think many of the details of its approach, it hasn't yet even decided. President Biden is prepared to engage personally with Kim Jong-un, but not until North Korea demonstrates through lower level engagement that it's willing to move forward on nuclear and missile issues. Uh, on the question of uh, uh, basing diplomacy uh, on previous agreements, including the Singapore uh, Joint Statement and the Panmunjong Declaration. Um, I, I, I'm not clear what that endorsement really means. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, is, is this a policy framework uh, that the Biden administration plans to follow? Or is its declaration of support for these statements uh, more a rhetorical gesture designed to placate the Moon administration and increase the odds of getting North Korea to the negotiating table. I don't know the answer to that question. It's an important one and, and we will see. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna stop there, but I'll make one other point just um, because I may not get a chance to do it again. Uh, several, uh, uh, references have been made to uh, terminating the revised uh, missile guidelines. Uh, I'm one of the only connoisseurs uh, who really appreciates this because I was the chief negotiator uh, of the first revision of those guidelines. We call it the new missile guidelines concluded in January 2001. I'm prepared to go on great length to, to talk about that. But one thing that no one has commented on, I'm probably one of five people that even noticed it, uh, was the common policy that no uh, re exports of nuclear power reactors will, made, will be made unless the recipient uh, agrees to adhere to the IAEA additional protocol. Uh, I, this would, will bore you, so I won't explain it, but it's very, very significant. Uh, it's something that South Korean nuclear industry was very reluctant to do. I'm very glad they accepted it. And if anyone has a question about it, I'm prepared to explain its significance for uh, non-proliferation. So I'll, I'll end there. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Uh, uh, thank you uh, both present, the presenters uh, for raising you know, very important issues. We can uh, spend more time on, on it later in the discussion session. Uh, second question we, we, uh, we prepared is, uh, President Biden and President Moon Jae-in had a summit meeting on May uh, 21st, as we know. How do we evaluate the discussions on the North Korea policy at this meeting? Has the two governments formed a consensus on the, uh, on the new North Korea policy? Uh, I'd like to ask Sumi and uh, bong to you know, respond to this uh, second question, even though, again, you are free to respond to other questions as well. Thank you. Uh, Sumi first. Can you hear me? Oh, sure. Well. Yeah, great, great. Um, so let me at least comment on the first part on the North Korea policy review. So then I think they were set up um, for me to answer the second part of the question. Um, I won't get into the North Korea policy review since there was already great introductory remarks and Bob just laid it out very uh, in detail 
uh, he articulated so well um, in terms of the Biden administration trying to strike a balance uh, between the strategic patience approach and uh, grand bargain strategy of President Trump. But in search for of this third way um, and in the Biden administration's desire to pursue a more uh, calibrated practical approach on denuclearization, the key points that stood out to me um, are in terms of this new policy uh, is that there, the recognition that there is the likelihood of a grand bargain uh, is small and that it will not be pursued. Uh, and that there's a commitment to diplomacy, at least on the part of the United States. Now, that said, and I'm not trying to criticize the Biden of this policy, and I, who can argue against something that's calibrated and practical, but since the question posed is whether this is a new policy, despite the Biden administration insisting that this is new and different policy from Obama's strategic patience approach, I would like to argue that in practice, that North Korea could see this policy basically amounting to Obama redux, more or less, uh, because Kim has said consistently that he, will, he would like to see some sort of unilateral, significant unilateral gesture coming out of Washington, such as sanctions relief and so on, um, or some sign that the US is not pursuing a hostile policy. Um, you know, he has made it very clear since the disappointing failure of the Hanoi summit uh, that, you know, even that he wants some sort of concessions, even to return to talks, which is obviously a non-starter for the Biden administration. In fact, Secretary Blinken has said, uh, just noted uh, that administ administration intends to maintain sanctions pressure on the Kim regime. So to me, you know, I, I hope Professor Moon is right. Uh, and he said he had a hunch that North Korea would engage with the United States now. And Dr. Kim ki Jong also said that South Koreans are feeling more optimistic and hopeful. I really hope this is right. Uh, but to me, in practical terms at the moment, I, I just don't see how we get there uh, in terms of breakthrough uh, because the Biden administration's policy is sort of like there's no detail, there's no nothing new or bold uh, out of it. Um, so to me, I, it, it might be practical, but not necessarily new or bold. And it appears to be designed mainly as a holding action while the administration deals with other pressing issues like China, Iran, global warming, fight against coronavirus and so on. So on the summit itself, I mean, let me just say that you know, I have participated myself in summit preparations before. I have some idea how, how much work is involved. And this, by all indication, this was very successful summit. Uh, but on the North Korea discussion, um, again, you know, I do think it was significant that Washington agreed to say, you know, we're going to build on the Singapore agreement. We're going to build on the Panmunjom declaration. Uh, we have a new special envoy for North Korea, uh, very able Ambassador Song Kim. And this, these are all wins for South Korea. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and, and Biden himself did not rule out meeting with Kim Jong-un, although he did say well, after working level talks produce some sort of a commitment on the part of North Korea that they're willing to make steps towards denuclearization. Um, but again, I, 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 you know, I just, while Washington and Seoul are in agreement, broadly speaking, in terms of forming consensus on this new North Korea policy, and I am sure they will work very closely. They have been doing so. They've been working closely with Seoul and Washington. They will continue to do so. But I do think it's too early to, to say whether they're going to be exactly on the same page in terms of moving forward on North Korea. President Moon said that his timeline for achieving results on North Korea matches up with President Biden's. But the fact is, Seoul, Seoul clearly has more of a sense of urgency because President Moon has less than a year left in office. And President Biden, let's face it, is occupied with a number of other pressing uh, issues. So the key challenge here, I do think, remains North Korea's you know, so far unwillingness to return to negotiations without some sort of unilateral gesture uh, um, from Washington. So I, I think, you know, I, I hope that, I hope this is not true, like, but what if, you know, Kim calculates, you know, I'm sorry, if I'm like a CIA, you know, background, but I'm always wor worried about the worst case scenario, but what happens if Kim Jong calculates that for the remaining year, this year, 
you know, he still is dealing with COVID concerns, vaccine concerns, and so on, that he's not going to rush into engaging with the United States. Uh, and instead, just dial up the pressure on the Biden administration to maximize its leverage so when they do return to dialogue, let's say maybe early next year, to in time for Beijing Olympics, uh, it, then we lose time. Um, and, you know, what do we do then? So I do think the most important and immediate issue that the U.S. and South Korea have to deal with in the coming months in terms of coordinating is how to bring back North, bring North back to the negotiating table without giving unilateral concessions like sanctions relief, because the Biden administration just says we're not going to do that. So how, how do we do that? And I think that's going to be the challenge for us. Uh, thank you, Sumi. Now, uh, thank you, Pong, uh, Pongun, please. Hello, good to see you. All, all of you looks very, you know, in, in good shape. Uh, I, out of this uh, uh, summit, uh, I was glad to see that uh, things are getting normalized. Uh, let me just uh, 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 touch very briefly about this. Uh, 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 Mr. Guidance issues. Korea, during the last 10 years, we have a very active uh, space uh, uh, program. We try to you know, have one. But the very funny thing here is that uh, we are cooperating with Russia, not the US NASA, because of this missile guidance program. You know, we are buying Russian rockets. There are people coming us and helping us fix them. But we couldn't cooperate with the United States because this missile program, missile program, now it's gone. Now I think we could work together. I think this alliance is becoming more of a normalized a partnership program. I'm, I'm very glad to see that. Let me turn to this North Korean issue. I was, uh, most of all, it was very positive. It was uh, the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, not CVID or, or denuclearization of North Korea. It was of having a, a very focused on dialogue and diplomacy, not the maximum pressure, not stick and carry, and not all, all, all options on the table. And also it, it mentioned the full implementation of US uh, Security Council resolutions, not sanctions. It mentions human rights values, but it was not overemphasized. And it was also you know, they agreed to provide humanitarian assistance to the DPRK. And also they accepted the South Korean request, you know, uh, succeed the Singapore Joint Statement, the Panmunjom Declaration, and the simult simultaneous pursuit of inter-Korean dialogue and the US DPRK dialogue. And also they supported the inter-Korean, uh, you know, family reunion, cooperation. And, but uh, in summary, I'm of the opinion that, uh, uh, in summary, they formed a general consensus on North Korea policy. But however, my observation here is that this general consensus was made not by intense negotiations from the South Korean part, but mostly by a coincidence of general principles and approaches over their North Korea policy. I think that's a very good sign. I predict that, that uh, U.S. government, this Biden guide, Biden government is going to pursue very active uh, strategic engagement with the DPRK from the early on. On the other hand, I was uh, predicting that the DPRK is going to pursue a policy of strategic patience toward the U.S. So far, it's okay, but I don't know how far it could go. But uh, uh, I also want to note that uh, despite this uh, general consensus on North Korean denuclearization strategy and approaches, their priority and the time schedule could be different. As it was mentioned, you know, we have only one year to go and you have, you have more focused on domestic politics and you have four more years to go. Uh, but uh, uh, regarding, and, uh, regarding North Korea's policies, I don't think uh, DPRK is welcoming the result of this summit wholeheartedly. Uh, they might be still waiting Washington's, Washington's answers to North Korea's demands for corresponding measures at the Hanoi summit. North Korea, North Korea also want to see their, uh, those parliament positive uh, 
element from the Washington summit for granted. It's nothing. For them, it's just, you know, just a beginning point. And probably pay more attention to those negative elements such as DPRK human rights issues and the strengthening the alliance's deterrence capability. They might be watching that. One scenario that I concern the most is that uh, uh, both US and North Korea believe that the ball is on the other's court. Biden administration does not intend to repeat a strategic patient policy. However, if it keeps waiting until DPRK returns to the table with its own ideas unconditionally, the result could be the one that it wants to avoid. Uh, that is another good sign. I wish that the Biden administration or President Biden write a letter addressed to President Kim Jong-un, not Chairman President Kim Jong-un, delivering his intention to succeed the Singapore Joint Statement and the proposing working level negotiations to implement those four goals in the Singapore Joint Statement. I think that this kind of personal letter or personal touch gives Kim an excuse to reverse his current uh, you know, uh, uh, hawkish position. I think that this kind of a, 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 at this time, both sides are thinking borrowed on the, the other's court. And if they keep waiting until the other side comes to the better gesture, the, the result could be the returning to the old days. But I think that could be this kind of writing letter could be a little bit awkward for the American audience probably, but I think it's possible because Obama, who was uh, intending to normalize relations with North Korea, Cuba, Iran, Myanmar in his early years. And also people are saying that the Iranian JCPOA is a successful because of strong sanctions. I don't think so. President Obama have a telephone call with uh, Rouhani and he exchanged letters with the uh, Iranian uh, uh, religious, religious leader, leader. I think this kind of a very high level exchange of letters and communications made Iran, you know, we can talk to the Americans this time. So, you know, I don't think this is, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very unusual, but uh, Obama did it, he was, did it, he did it uh, despite the very strong opposition within, you know, U.S. Congress, but he would, could get the JCPA because of his kind of a this really audacious uh, gesture. I, I think if we really want to have a, a decolonization moving on, I think the U.S. need to take uh, uh, take a little bit of uh, a active measures. Also, DPRK is in desperate need of uh, you know health and uh, this uh, 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 controlling of uh, infectious diseases. I think it could be hard to provide any bilateral assistance, but we could use other UN organizations and the WHO to provide those uh, you know, medical and, and health assistance. And also in the regional level, President Moon proposed a Southeast, Northeast Asia regional uh, health and uh, you know, infectious disease control cooperation dialogue. I think there was already about the, I think two meetings there. I we expect that we encourage DPRK coming to that uh, uh, consultation mechanism. Through that process, we could uh, uh, talk to the DPRK and and you have an opportunity to provide some uh, some you know so assistance. Finally, uh, what Chang is our uh, level? Hongun, Hong uh, would you uh, our you know? Give you a chance to speak on the final point later. Uh, thank you, Sumi and, and Bongun. Uh, and the, the third question will, uh, uh, is on uh, the prospects of North Korea policy. Can the Biden administration's new North Korea policy succeed? What are the main challenging factors in implementing the Biden administration's new North Korea policy in the future? What is the most important issue that South Korea and the United States should coordinate for a successful North Korea policy? I would like, I would like to ask Sanghyun and, and Frank to share with us 
your thoughts on, on this issue. Thank you. Uh, Sangyam first. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Peck. Well, uh, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty much in line with the previous uh, panelist in evaluating uh, Biden's North Korea policy and the outcome of the uh, rugby the summit uh, 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 statement. Uh, I will comment on uh, th three uh, issues. Uh, uh, first one is that uh, Biden's North Korea policy and rugby the summit uh, successfully uh, uh, paved the way for general uh, overall direction of the uh, North Korea policy, but as, as you know, uh, we don't have we don't have um, yet uh, much detail about this policy. So even though we have a broader agreement on the general direction of North Korea policy, still we have a very uh, a difficult process of coordinating uh, priorities and details of the policy and what should be the. Uh, negotiating the best negotiating strategy in dealing with North Korea. And obviously, what one big difference uh, in North Korea uh, is that its uh, nuclear capability has been much more uh, uh, grown uh, these days. So, given that difference, so uh, is it still val val valid uh, to approach the issue step by step way that we have tried before? What do we need some uh, different approach, like uh, dealing, uh, solving the big issue first and uh, dealing the uh, small ones later? That's the so called front loading way uh, that we had tried before in dealing with uh, North Korea nuclear issue. A second point is that uh, if we look at uh, from North Korean perspective, uh, 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 we, we, don't find any good, any new incentive for North Korea to cooperate with these uh, policies. So before the summit, uh, many people anticipated that uh, President Moon and Biden may talk about uh, easing uh, sanctions and declaration to end the Korean War and early resuming of the uh, US DPRK dialogue, but these issues were not addressed uh, uh, enough in summit. So given that uh, how North Korea will respond to this uh, policy and uh, summit, I think that's a big question uh, we have to answer. And third point is that uh, China factor uh, uh, still uh, so far uh, not many discussion was done on China issue. Uh, and I would point out that uh, in uh, uh, recent summit, uh, during the statement mentioned about uh, uh, China, uh, rule-based international order, uh, rule of law, freedom of navigation, all points to the China. And uh, the joint statement clearly uh, shows that South Korea will be side with the United States in checking uh, China. Also, uh, missile guideline, termination of missile guideline will have some uh, uh, backdraft from China. So given if we have that account in uh, that factor in account, perhaps in the future, China's influence, how can we uh, induce a Chinese cooperation may be an important challenge that both uh, US and uh, South Korea should think about. Well, another point is that uh, already uh, previous panelists mentioned is the issue of a time frame, as we uh, discussed. Um, uh, Moon Jae-in government is in, uh, President Moon is in his last year in office. Uh, President Biden has just begun his first year. And uh, this summit, if you look at that, uh, I evaluate that summit put everything uh, that Seoul and uh, Washington was in one basket. So we have to prioritize the issue. And, so, and also we have to uh, 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 think about what was the reasonable, uh, feasible approach uh, to dealing with those issues. I think that's the, some challenge that uh, both Seoul and Washington should coordinate in the future. And particularly uh, because uh, President Moon is in his last year, uh, I, I would like to recommend that uh, President Moon should resist, uh, resist the temptation to irreversibly speed up uh, uh, Korean peace, uh, Korean political peace process. Let me stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sang Yeon. Uh, Frank, please. Thank you, Dr. Peck. Um, so I largely agree with Sumi. Uh, the Biden administration's calibrated and practical approach is not 
a new approach. This is in many respects, the same measured and, and realistic approach that was used by the Clinton, Bush, and even Obama administrations, uh, at least in the first term for many years. And this could be both good and bad. The good part is that the calibrated and practical approach has a track record of some moderate success. It led to the agreed framework, which froze the uh, plutonium reprocessing for eight years. It led to more progress uh, as part of the six party talks. And, and it led to the short lived successes of the leak day deal in the Singapore statement. So I, I think it's fine to use those aspects of the old approach that work. So that's the good part. Uh, but the old approach also has some potential problems. Uh, the first problem is that it maintains the framing of North Korea solely as a threat that needs to be deterred and contained rather than also as potentially a mutual partner that needs to be respected and heard. And so I think from North Korea's view, this means that the US could be perceived as you know, maintaining its hostile policy, as Sumi said. I'll note that when um, President Biden gave his remarks to the US Congress recently, he grouped North Korea with Iran as a serious threat that needed to be dealt with through stern deterrence. And not surprisingly, North Korea responded negatively. And I wouldn't be surprised if this pairing with Iran reminded North Korea of President Bush's axis of evil line in 2002. Uh, the second problem with the old approach is that it tends to focus more aggressively on what we want, things like denuclearization and human rights and, and having North Korea take the first step. Uh, and it tends to be passive and cautious when it comes to addressing what North Korea wants, including things like the new USDPRK relations, peace regime, sanctions relief, or even a moratorium on deployments of US strategic assets to the Korean Peninsula. Uh, fortunately, I think the US and South Korea took an encouraging step in their summit joint statement by reaffirming the Singapore agreement and describing complete denuclearization and permanent peace as twin goals for the Korean Peninsula. A third potential problem with uh, the calibrated practical approach is that it tends to be cautious and risk averse. And I think both sides are guilty of this. This approach leads to both sides uh, trying to maximize leverage before even getting back to the negotiating table. We saw this, um, well, I think, yeah, and when you, when you maximize leverage, um, I think that often means that a crisis is required to precipitate talks. Uh, we saw this with the nuclear crisis that preceded the agreed framework, North Korea's withdrawal from the NPT that led to the six party talks, the Chunan sinking and the Waipido shelling that precipitated the leak day deal. And then of course the fire and fury and testing period that led to the Singapore agreement. You know, I think instead of wasting time and raising tensions with this, these kinds of provocation cycles, it'd be a lot more productive if we skip the crisis part and just get back straight to talks. Um, it's hard to say whether the Biden approach will fall victim to these uh, types of potential problems since the policy was so sparse in details. Um, but again, like I said, there, there were the encouraging signals like the reaffirmation of the Singapore statement. Um, there's also the immediate recognition that talks should start bilaterally between the US and DPRK. Um, and then also the description of, of peace and description uh, and denuclearization as dual goals. But again, the Biden policy was also uh, signaling caution and, and risk aversion and even conventional thinking as well. So I think the question now is, you know, whether North Korea is intrigued enough by the Biden approach to play ball. The positive scenario would be that Pyongyang wants to have more details than was provided publicly. And so it takes up the US offer to have a meeting to learn more. And then the negative scenario is that North Korea decides that there's nothing new in what the US has stated, that the hostile policy remains and it needs to restart its testing cycle to increase pressure on Washington. Um, and then the last point I'll make on a separate note on the missile guidelines. So I was, uh, I was leading the, the working level discussions back in 2012 uh, on the missile guidelines when it was about extending the ballistic missile range from 300 kilometers to 800 kilometers and went from the new missile guidelines to revised missile guidelines. It's interesting that this period from 2012 to the current day 
Uh, South Korea has engaged in a dramatic ramp up of its defense capabilities, ballistic missiles, uh, the upgrade from PAC-2 to PAC-3s, indigenous fighters, um, you know, there's just so many things that it's doing in terms of this kill chain, its own air and missile defense. Talk about Iron Dome, uh, Apache helicopters, F-35s, Global Hawk, um, all of this exacerbating North Korea to the point where I think now North Korea is going to focus more on South Korea rather than the U.S. in terms of the proximate threat. Over. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, so, uh, you know, the six presentations on trip now, and I, uh, I think, you know, we had a rich stuff for discussion. And definitely uh, there are agreements and disagreements, uh, particularly in the details, and also uh, uh, there, uh, there are points uh, that, you know, that we have to uh, elaborate and also clarify. So, uh, you know, we are, we are behind the schedule by uh, almost 20 minutes, but I will give you, uh, you know, six presenters and also uh, two uh, keynote speakers, if you want to join this discussion by raising, uh, you know, making comments and raising questions to, to, to one another. Uh, who will uh, go first? Maybe, uh, maybe Bob. I just, um, I, I, I uh, agree very much with, with Sue um, and her um, uh, uh, view that while there's a lot of convergence on paper in the joint statement in particular, um, this uh, very uh, skillfully crafted um, harmonious joint statement may cover some serious um, differences um, and uh, in a number of respects. I think, for example, on, on uh, uh, inter-Korean uh, relations. Uh, soon after the joint statement, uh, President Moon uh, uh, re reiterated his longstanding position that movement on inter-Korean relations could create a virtuous circle uh, that could lead to progress um, on the on US DPRK relations and in particular the nuclear issue. Um, uh, President Biden uh, may uh, be genuinely supportive of uh, inter-Korean relations and prepared to cut President Moon some slack in moving ahead uh, in that area. Uh, but uh, I'm confident the U.S. bureaucracy is not prepared to cut much slack. Uh, and so we will see going forward um, what, uh, what happens on, uh, uh, on, on that. Um, uh, because this will be the last time I'll take the floor, let me just uh, mention, uh, 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 Saudi Arabia wants to buy nuclear reactors. Uh, South Korea... Uh, has excellent reactors and has done very well selling them to the UAE. Uh, it's probably the, four, the front runner in getting the bid for this lucrative uh, contract. Uh, but uh, the uh, Saudis refuse to adhere to this uh, IA additional protocol. Um, and and that's, a, that's worrisome because the Saudi crown prince says Saudi will get nuclear weapons if Iran does. So they have this motivation and it's very important that they join the additional protocol. Uh, now, if uh, South Korea is now committed uh, to insisting that its customers join the additional protocol, that's a very, very positive thing. So I wanted to, uh, to, to uh, put in that uh, infomercial uh, for a non-proliferation in the Middle East. Any, uh, any response or any, anything? Uh, Kijong? Yes. Um, well, you know, Biden, Biden administration, North Korea policy, yes, uh, just Frank and Sumi said that it is, uh, it is not new. Uh, it is old and new, you know, the, so I said it was, uh, it, it looked like uh, it is, it is a political compromise among the you know, existing uh, approach, you know, to North Korea, as I said, you know, three, uh, you know, categorization. 
Yes, we all know that the bowl is on the now bowl is on the North Korean coal, and we have to wait. But I think the first initial uh, measure, you know, suggested by the Washington, jointed by the South Korea, I think this is a you know a good sign. Uh, we, as far as we are concerned, that uh, you know this is good sign to North Korea. You know, to resume the dialogue, maybe North Korea would be, uh, you know, North Korea, maybe they would, you know, take some time. There would be no prompt response, you know, to the, you know, to that, uh, you know, suggestion because in North Korea there was a no CNN effect. So maybe they they would have a hot debate how to deal with uh, this suggestion. I think that uh, as far as we assume that uh, you know they will take a time, and maybe there there would be a, a hot debate about the you know strategic calculation, uh, how to accept or how to deal with the uh, initial you know the measures by Washington. I think that uh, there was a, you know that assumption is a good sign because. Uh, uh, since the uh, you know deadlock, the, you know stalemate of the you know Hanoi and bilateral talk between Pyongyang and Washington, we th we are uh, deeply worried about that. Within the North Korea, there would be uh, or, you know it is also uh, you know speculation, but in uh, uh, we assume that there are two different groups uh, with regard to the you know the. Uh, North Korean security. There is a, you know, military or you know, hawkish group and uh, you know, dovish group. Maybe you know, in dovish group, that we we assume that uh, you know, develop you know, economic development is uh, relatively more important for uh, North Korea. So, but in uh, since the uh, you know Hanoi failure, uh, I think that the security group seems to dominate the the, the whole you know discursive you know. Uh, uh, you know, atmosphere uh, within North Korea. Again, uh, you know, the assumption that North Korea would uh, take time and to, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, debate about the strategic calculation to, you know, to respond. I think that that would, you know, that means that uh, uh, North Korea strategy, North Korea strategy would not be easily, you know, dominated by the security group. Again, um, I think there was a, you know, I think uh, this is a good word. Parallel connection, parallel connection between uh, US DPRK talk and, uh, you know, inter-Korean talk. I think this is uh, with the, we call it success of the, you know, summit meeting between Moon and Biden I think that the, uh, the situation on the Korean Peninsula now seems to be a uh, uh, new chapter. We call it this is a you know resurrection of 2018, because I I I observe that this is very much important a term that Biden is a supporting South Korea's cooperation dialogue as well as engagement to North Korea. I think that 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 that, that is. Uh, uh, very much important. So it is a virtuous uh, trilateral talk in terms of a structure of the dialogue. I think that the you know parallel connection between the two you know bilateral talk would be shaped. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kijong. Uh, any uh, any comments or questions or any uh, anything from anybody toward the uh, you know agreements you know. And disagreements, not not to agreements, but to disagreements and clarification issues that need clarification, elaboration, etc. Well, Ambassador Yoon and I raised the hands. Yeah. Oh, really? I could not see it. Oh, and then Ambassador Yoon first, and then Sanyeon. Yeah, please. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I I think from Washington's point of view, I mean, the the, the feeling I get is there is kind of a good alignment right now uh, for, for dialogue with North Korea. I mean, certainly politically, uh, you have had President Trump engage Kim Jong-un at the highest level. So you're not going to have 
as much criticism on diplomacy with North Korea from the Republican camp. And that was typically the case. Uh, uh, Republicans uh, up in uh, US Congress were very much opposed to it. Second thing is I think personnel. Uh, we do have number of experienced personnel, you know, from Tony Blinken on to Jake Sullivan to Kurt Campbell, Wendy Sherman and others who know quite well what this is about and they have a degree of ambition. And so I think if we can get it started, I think there will be a lot of uh, enthusiasm and it could catch fire. So, so, so I, the, 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 the main challenge is how to get it started, but I think that can be figured out. I mean, I really like uh, 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 Dr. John's idea of a letter, but of course, before that letter can be sent, you need at least some signal back and forth that such a letter would be received with a degree of uh, warmth, you know? So, so there are some groundwork to do, but, but I do think uh, the, the atmosphere in, in Washington uh, 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 can get, we can soon get traction. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Joe. Sang-yeon, and then uh, Chairman Moon, please. Sang-yeon, well, first. Thank you. Uh, I have a brief question to uh, American panelists. Uh, in the joint statement, uh, uh, there's a mentioning about uh, uh, endorsing uh, Pupton Declaration. But at the same time, the statement clearly mentioned the full implementation of the UN Security Council resolution. So how do you evaluate where is more weight uh, from, on the, uh, from the uh, Biden administration's uh, uh, stance? So uh, can, in, in many people in Korea, we uh, were enjoy, uh, uh, quite uh, uh, optimistic that uh, United States may be allowing some uh, uh, room for maneuver, for independent room for maneuver in inter-Korean relations. So do you uh, uh, agree in that interpretation? Uh, any uh, American American participants response to uh, sang question? Uh, and then uh, you can think about it, then you, uh, please raise your hand later. And uh, Chairman Moon, please. I think the, the, the Sangyang is raising very important question because the Moon Jae-in government is really you know, will, willing to do something with North Korea. For example, resumption of the gas and industrial complex, maybe you know, carbon zero uh, you know, approach. You know, the, you know, President Kim Jong-un is very much interested in joining this you know, climate change you know, discourse, maybe replacing of old, <coughs> you know, uh, all the uh, what the uh, uh, electric power in the stations in North Korea by more you know carbon free you know the facilities and whatever. Therefore, <clears throat> well, I, I would like to ask a question to you know Bob and you know, Joe and Sue, you know the American uh, Sumi, the American participant. You know even before North Korea approached to the United States for practical dialogue, if South Korea take that kind of very, you know, <clears throat> audacious, you know, uh, project toward North Korea, would the Biden administration be accommodating that kind of approach? Of course, South Korean government will abide by the United Nations Security Council resolutions. But uh, within that framework, South Korea, <clears throat> there can be a lot of works to South Korea uh, you know, make a proposal to North Korea. Uh, Sumi, please. Well, this is what I was saying that it's it's a problem because there's no details. Uh, Blinken came out with a statement says we, we're going to continue to implement sanctions uh, until there is some sort of a breakthrough. Um, so you know, it's it's unclear if it's if if the economic projects are in violation of the UNSC sanctions or US sanctions, uh, if that's where we can go. So I mean, I, I don't have an answer because I'm not. I don't think the Biden administration made that clear. And if so, from the North Korean perspective, if I could just say, you know, so far they're watching this. They're sort of wait and see mode. Thank goodness they didn't showcase any weapons, new weapons capabilities, or did anything. I think they are just waiting to see and trying to process everything. And there are a couple of good things that came out of the summit from the North Korean perspective, right? The joint statement, 
basically reaffirming the Singapore summit and the Panmunjom declaration. So that's good. There's a special envoy, so that's good. But then again, there is sort of the, you know, the Biden, even President Biden actually during the Q&A uh, said something like, I'm not gonna, you know, not gonna ever give North Korea uh, what Kim Jong-un, what he's looking for in terms of international recognition as a nuclear weapon state. Uh, the ball is in North Korea's court, the sanctions not gonna be lifted. So again, I think this is sort of a mixed messages right now. And I think our window of time to act, both Washington and Seoul, is it's not a whole lot. We need to sort of act so that North Koreans can kind of, uh, you know, we take their interest in engaging with us. I think everybody's sort of waiting and seeing um, to see what, what the Biden administration is going to. So I don't really have a clear answer. And I think this is part of the problem. I don't know if Frank or somebody else has yeah. got an answer. If I can jump in. Uh, so during the campaign, the Biden uh, team said that they would look at ways to find the right formula for sanctions enforcement, as well as sanctions relief. And even, you know, there's been reports where, you know, anonymous uh, Biden administration officials have talked about the necessity of providing sanctions relief, right? So the idea is, how do you thread that needle um, to, to both, you know, support the Pemunjong Declaration but also enforce sanctions. I think it, it may involve, you know, some sort of exemptions, waivers that allow for things like joint ventures or, you know, uh, bulk cash transfers or things that would allow inter-Korean cooperation uh, to continue. But again, the, I, the question is, you know, how do you sequence that with North Korean steps as well? I think that's the key. But there's ways to do it. Obviously, you can get sanctions exemptions. Uh, thank you, Frank. I, I wish we had more time. Uh, Bob, you know, you are the last commentator, and then we will move to the next segment, the Q&A session. Please, Bob, please. Yeah, I was just going to answer uh, uh, Moon chong uh, question. Um, you know, I know the administration has uh, done a lot of study about sanctions relief uh, and the kind of hierarchy there. Uh, and I think, um, you know, in exchange for movement on, uh, on nuclear issues, they're prepared to go pretty far. And they look in particular uh, at uh, restrictions uh, on North Korean imports. Uh, the reason is that um, things like uh, importing refined petroleum products and other kinds of imports, uh, when North Korea imports, it draws down its, its uh, reserves or it eats up its uh, hard currency. So why not let them go forward with that? So I think those are among the, the first things to go. In terms of inter-Korean projects, um, you know, the, 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 what I see is the big three, Kumgang Mountain, uh, Kaesong Industrial Complex, and the, raid, the Rail and Road uh, project. I think, you know, the bureaucracy is quite dug in. Um, and seeking recipro reciprocity from the North uh, on any of those things. And I'm wondering, I, I, I turn the question back to, to you, chung in about humanitarian uh, support in some way. Now this got a, uh, you know, some treatment in the joint statement. Uh, is there something that can be done in the humanitarian space um, that could uh, uh, demonstrate that the Biden uh, administration is prepared to support assistance to the North, especially in dealing with some of its current health problems, uh, but also helping uh, the South uh, move ahead on its North-South agenda. Is there anything in that area that would be worthwhile? Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, let me turn to the Q&A session. We, uh, we don't have uh, much time remaining, but uh, you know, let me just, you know, read one of the questions. Uh, this is for Ambassador Yoon. As you said, we have MPCR to control WMD proliferation. By ending the missile guideline, ROK is recognized as a responsible actor in an international non-proliferation efforts. One might argue that there will be more pressure for ROK to, uh, to restrain its enrichment and reprocessing capabilities. How does it relate to uh, how does it relate to your mentioning of the nuclear civilian nuclear sovereignty of South Korea? So this is really a question for Bob. You know? <laughs> so I'm gonna agree with anything Bob says. Okay, yeah, Bob. <laughs> 
the, yeah, the bar, please. Yeah, ju yeah, just briefly, because uh, I was involved in the revision of the uh, US ROK uh, 123 agreement. Uh, and in it, uh, we agreed, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the South Koreans wanted to go forward with pyro processing and enrichment, and the US resisted that. And we, we kind of kicked the can down the road by agreeing to a 10 year fuel cycle uh, study, which is about due uh, now. Um, it, it's not clear how the US will come out. Uh, the Department of Energy has been much more promotional uh, of a number of technologies that we used to uh, frown upon. So maybe that will have uh, some uh, effect there. Uh, but uh, I think uh, in general, the US will be discouraging um, the ROK from pursuing uh, ENR, enrichment or reprocessing, uh, because there's no, uh, there's no serious economic rationale for it. And there are lots of non-proliferation downsides. So I wouldn't expect any real change in the US position. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, you know, I, I personally very much enjoyed, you know, your presentation and discussion and as well as keynote speeches. Uh, it's now, now time to close. Uh, thank you, uh, USIP again. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Frank. Let's continue our cooperation between our two institutions. And uh, uh, finally, let me close by uh, sharing with you leadership change at Sejong Institute. Uh, my, uh, one of the most trusted colleagues uh, Sang Hyun Lee, sitting over there, uh, was named the next president of Sejong Institute. Uh, he will be inaugurated on uh, June 1st. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, this means that I will be completing my tenure as, as the uh, president of Sejong by the end of this, this month. So, uh, uh, I want to, uh, you know, I want to, to uh, continue to support Sejong Institute and uh, for my new president. Please join me in giving him a big congratulatory support. Well, thank you for the very generous, kind introduction. I will, uh, as, as you uh, also mentioned, I will uh, continue cooperative relationship with the USIP. And once again, uh, I appreciate all of you uh, who joined the today's webinar. And as I mentioned earlier, Sejong will host uh, at least six or seven webinars of this kind uh, throughout the year. So. Uh, please uh, stay tuned. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sangyan, and thank you all very much.